Welcome to the Probate Realtor Show, your one source for selling and buying real estate through trust and probate. Hear directly from the best attorneys and trusted advisors on how executors and administrators navigate the probate process in and out of court. Being a personal representative or successor trustee can be a daunting task, and often beneficiaries don't have a clear plan. Let us help you make the right decision for your clients, your family, and your legacy. And now, here's your host, the probate realtor himself, Matias Baker Mazzucci. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of our very exciting show. Today, I am joined by Senior Wealth Advisor, Rick Knott. Rick, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Matthias. Rick is with Lord Murray and is not just a pleasure to be around, as my audience will learn, but also a wealth of information. See the pun there? A wealth of information. <laughs> um, okay, Rick, let's, let's delve right into it. The show that I'm going to talk about, as you know, our show is geared toward, toward estate planning probate. And one of the important things that we all see and what I want to talk to you about is that the inheritance of a large sum of money. So we're going to talk about the psychology of money and what happens when somebody inherits. You know, actually, it doesn't even matter what your net worth is. If you inherit a bunch of money, you may assume, you know what? Hey, so let's, let's talk about that. In your professional experience, how do you reconcile? This is a very targeted question. Hmm. How do you reconcile the desire for instant gratification hmm. with what we do, essentially, planning for long-term wealth? How do you do that? It's, it's such a fantastic question, Matthias, and uh, it really gets to the heart of everything related to money and, and finance. It, it's really interesting. Frankly, what you've just described is, you know, in, in, in my world, the time value of money, mm -hmm. and everyone has a different preference for money over time. So how much are you willing to spend today on your lifestyle, on just having fun, on, you know, we all work hard, um, hopefully you play hard as well, uh, versus saving for the future? And uh, that, that reconciliation is something that should be done for, for every individual person uniquely. It's just not going to be the same. So uh, usually when I speak with, with folks, and I've been doing this for uh, a long time, 15 years in, in the business just about, but generally speaking, you can kind of find uh, what uh, there's clues in, in your current lifestyle as to how you will uh, be able to defer that into, into the future for your, your future lifestyle. And, you know, just asking based, basic questions around, uh, you know, how much are people saving? How much are you mm -hmm. spending? Most people don't know how much they're, they're spending. They might know how much they're saving. Uh, right. th those types of things are, are great indicators of uh, your time preferences for money. That makes total sense. I'm going to take a little step back now because I wanted to ask you a question, actually, related to the, related to the mechanics. So this is like, it's going to tie into this. But this is when somebody inherits a large amount of money. What you don't know them, but maybe they're listening to this. What would you say? What should I do? First and foremost, probably do nothing just for a little while. Just let it settle. Let it sit and just understand how your life is today and recognize it depends on how much that money is, of course. And of right. course, how much it is relative to what you already have. Mm -hmm. But there are very few instances where any sort of money that you're receiving are really going to change your life in any meaningful way. Right. And what I mean by that is outside of winning, you know, $100 million in the lottery, for most people, you know, you have a mortgage, maybe you have uh, student loans, you know, those right. are large sums. And if you think about that on an after tax basis, you know, those are probably the first thing that you should be spending it on. But for most folks, probably just do nothing and have an understanding and talk to a professional or at least talk to, you know, the, the people in your family and around you and how it would be most useful for you in the future. And I think more importantly, frankly, understand the potential of that windfall, because a dollar today could very easily be worth uh, 10x in 30 years at something like 8%. So what's the potential of a million dollar windfall in 30 years? And if you make decisions based upon the future, thinking of the future, you'll make better decisions today. I love that. You're absolutely correct. We have a tendency, myself included, to... Think about just what is happening now. But I think in what you just said, there are some gold nuggets nuggets that I would like to extract. One of the things you said is take care of the liability. 
take care of the liabilities, the liabilities you have going, which um, student loans, mortgages, et cetera, et cetera. If you have any liability, that's probably should be your priority. Now, when we talk about the amount, the amount, you know, the market we live in, you know, we are both living in Los Angeles. And mm -hmm. one of the things that, you know, over here, when people sell a house, sometimes they, if their parents' house, if they bought it, you know, in the 50s or 60s or whenever, and chances are they get like a million dollars, that number, it's like $1 million, like right around there. Maybe there's enough equity on that. You know, if you're lucky, obviously, sometimes that is not the case. So if somebody, it all depends by their net worth, right? If somebody is, I was, I'm shocked to hear, and you hear these statistics all the time, and I'm sure you do too, how little savings people have. You work in the financial sector. You're a wealth advisor. So you work with people who have savings. Good. I work with people you know, selling homes and, and, and buying real estate. So most of the people that I de interact with have savings. But that is a small portion of, this, of, the, of the population. So what I'm going with this and asking you is that how does somebody learn how to become a saver? You know, I have a lot of money now. And I need to learn how to become a saver. What, it, what are some of the mm. tips you can give in that sense? It's a very interesting question and a great one. And I think it's one that can only be answered uh, by looking at it through two different lenses. Okay. There's the mechanics. You know, most people want to learn or find out a, a secret or a trick or a tip uh, for something. And there's certainly that, right? There's the bucketing method. There's the pay yourself first method. There's all these different methods if you look up online to right. uh, save more over time. I think it's also too imp important to understand where your feelings about saving or maybe not saving come from. And they usually come from you know, past experiences. Most of that we learn from our family, from our you know, early childhood. And uh, those two things combined are the most effective strategy. What, do I, mean, what I mean by that is in, in behavioral economics, there's this thing called choice architecture. And right? mm -hmm. so uh, how can you design something in a way where you, without even thinking, just make the best choices? So a good example of this is, is a, a 401k. Most 401ks, and uh, this is law actually now, but it, it wasn't previously, but there's some rules where they opt people in, right? So if you start up a new company and there's a 401k, they will automatically enroll you at mm -hmm. you know, 5%. And you have to log in and say, you know what, actually, I don't want to. And the enrollment by doing that is significantly greater than if you did not enroll people and said, hey, you should enroll in this thing, even though yes. they want to and they know that they should. And so that slight little uh, nudge, as it's called, or choice architecture is, is huge. And so from a savings perspective, I take the opinion that budgeting, it's great. I absolutely love it. It's really hard for most people to do. And so if you can design your, your finances in such a way that just makes saving automatic and easy, like paying yourself first as an example, is probably the best mm -hmm. one, you will save more and make better financial decisions. Very good. Now, you mentioned a couple of uh, systems, the bucketing systems and things like that. What percentages, like I remember, you know, you know, thinking when I did, you know, my kind of like planning, I would, I should say. You know, thinking, okay, this percentage should go in this account for taxes, right? This percentage goes for taxes. This other thing goes for, you know, for this, and this other thing goes for that. So I guess my question to you, and I know this is very, it varies from person to person. Somebody retires, somebody's in, you know, making production and things like that. But since it varies and there's no answer, and mm -hmm. it appears that what we're talking about here is education. Somebody, you need to get educated. Where, where would you look for answers in that case? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, what most folks do is, is, you know, you're looking online, you talk to friends. Mm -hmm. Spending is, is an interesting one because it's a very personal thing, right? It's a very personal, you, you can, we've talked about this before, you can outsource a lot of really critical decisions like uh, yes. your tax decisions, your estate planning decisions to professionals who know it very well. But ultimately, your spending decisions, how you choose to allocate your, your capital, your money, that's really you. You can't really outsource that uh, for the most part. It's really incumbent upon you to be educated about how the impact of what you're doing today uh, affects things in the future. You know, the bucketing method is one that I like a lot. It's especially helpful for folks who are kind of entering into maybe retirement and you're converting from getting a paycheck to living off your assets where you have, you know, depends on the situation, but basically three buckets. You have a short-term bucket, which is all cash. And I think this works for people who are, are saving as well. You have a short-term bucket, which is all cash. It's your emergency fund. It's just liquid in case you need something. And you have a mid-term bucket, which is a little more aggressive. 
Uh, it might have some stocks, it might have some um, uh, things that aren't too risky. And then your long-term bucket is your almost aspirational bucket. And that's for things 20, 30, 40 years down the line. That might even be for your uh, kids as a legacy um, or your heirs. And uh, that bucketing approach works from a psychological perspective and behavioral perspective because it allows you to, to uh, take the risk in the long-term bucket without necessarily wanting to sell, but also to have that peace of mind knowing you have short-term liquidity if you need it. So that's one of the most fantastic methods out there. This is one I use personally. Good. That, that's that, and th Thank you for sharing that. Now, you mentioned a couple of things here that are very interesting. One of the things is that I just recently read an article. I don't know if I read it in an article or somewhere. It's about the, the rapper Eminem, that how mm. he called his financial manager and he was like, I, he wanted to buy a watch because he had been struggling for so long that you know he didn't have much money. And he called to find out if he could afford it. And the financial manager was kind of shocked. He was like, yeah, you can afford to buy the watch. And that's interesting because it goes back to what we talked about, which is your upbringing and mm. your past experiences shape you. So I can see it, you know, if you had to fend for your own at some point in life, you know, your parents or whatever, they said, okay, you're on your own now, you know, do your best. I see it with my children in the fact that mm. like, if I give them to care, for something like they have to care for it, they take more responsibility. But if they, if I care for it for them, they have a tendency to neglect it or not care for it so much. So if somebody has, you know, their past experiences, when somebody comes to you, and let's go with the example that somebody inherited some money and they find you online and they're like, look, I just inherited $5 million. I've been working at McDonald's all my life. I don't know what to do with this money. I came across your name. You sound like a trustworthy guy. What does the process look like? What do you, you know, without yes. giving away, obviously, you know, I don't want you to give away, tell them the to buy Tesla or stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, don't give away the secret stuff. But what does that process look like? I usually try to frame all financial discussions from this perspective. You can have uh, money as the center of your decisions. Mm -hmm. And when you think and look at the world that way, you tend to have, frankly, a lot of money problems, right? But if you can change your perspective and put instead the purpose and your values around money as the center of, of those decisions, mm -hmm. then really what you end up with is, is options. And so the first step in, in the process that I have with, with every client is we usually sit down with their prospect is one and a half hours, one, one and a half hours. And I just want to understand what's important to them about money who's most important to them, what their long-term goals are, and of course, what their values are in the long-term. You know, what would you like to do? Because if I can understand those things, it makes the decision on what to do with your money and when and how much risk to take, et cetera, very, very simple. It just stay in alignment with those goals and it makes the financial decisions much, much easier. I, I like that. So, so ultimately, you know, when you have your initial conversation, you're getting to know the person. By learning, learning what the person prioritizes. So somebody tells you, you know, I've narrated 5 million. I need, I'm just throwing numbers out there, you know. I need 100,000 to live a year to support my family. That's what I need. I'm okay with investing the rest, et cetera, et cetera. But I also want to create, you know, I would love for my children to, to have enough money when they grow up or whatever. I always, I love that quote by Warren Buffett that says, you know, I'm going to leave my kids enough money so they uh, don't need anything, but not enough so they don't do anything, something like mm, that. You know, yeah, like so they're want for nothing. They're want for nothing, but somebody that has a long-term strategy. So we talk about the example of like, you know, they're doing well and they all, they need this and that. When you understand something like that, that they have a long-term a long -term strategy, what are the things that you recommend that somebody does when, when they don't need the money immediately? If they don't need the money immediately, you know, it, it's, it can be a very complex in, interplay. And, you know, I, I work with investments, obviously, I'm an investment advisor, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also a, a planner. And the planning piece isn't just investments, it involves taxes, it involves a business, it involves uh, estate planning. And the interplay of all of those things together can be fairly complex, right? What, what is the best decision in one area might be the exact opposite uh, optimal decision in another area. So for someone who's inherited money and, you know, first step, just kind of sit on it and understand it and uh, have a discovery process, you know, either internally, frankly, both, or, you know, with an advisor, uh, some sort of professional and go back and look at, uh, here's one of the questions that I, that I love to ask people. 
what have been your top three biggest financial mistakes, as well as your top three uh, biggest financial wins or your best decisions. And it tells me just a lot about uh, how folks are thinking, how decisions are being made, and of course, uh, what, what's important to, to that person in general. So, uh, you know, those things really have to be under, understood quite well. And then, you know, you really just have to do an inventory of everything that you have, right? So a lot of folks don't have a balance sheet in the way that a company has a balance sheet, but everyone should really have a, a balance sheet. Everyone should really understand at least the first five years of cash flow, money coming in and money coming mm -hmm. out. And that tells and will give you a lot of clarity into, uh, again, where that money can best be utilized as it relates back to your uh, long-term values and, and goals. That makes that makes total sense. Now, we talked about, you know, taking care of debts, you know, obligations. It's good, you know, learning how to save. That's another aspect that is important. Controlling the spending, That there is a lot of psychology in that. You know, there's a lot Huge. of psychology. There is a pressure. We all feel it. You know, no matter what to even, even no matter what your financial status is, there's a pressure to keep up with the Joneses, whoever the <clears> Joneses are to you at the beginning of your career. Maybe it's your high school buddies. You know, when you're a little bit older, maybe it's your neighbors, you know, whatever it is that 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 you have that desire. What can people do to I guess this is, I'm getting a little bit on the metaphysical now, but, you know, <laughs> what can what can people do to get educated about spending, you know, understanding things? And, and do you help with that? If somebody, you know, if somebody that comes to you says, yeah, I'm go buying this gold-plated surfboard. I really need it. I'm going to hang it up in my house. It's going to mm. look amazing. I know it's delicate, you know, because maybe they have a lot of money and it's not your business to say, well, you know, spending $250,000 on a surfboard may not be the best idea. But do you tactfully communicate that? or Absolutely. Or you're like, okay. Absolutely. First and foremost, I said I don't like budgets. We don't call them budgets. We call them spending plans. Okay. Uh, but you know, frankly, again, I just don't think the budgeting, you know, you look at your expenses over the year and you kind of track those midway over the month, you track those midway and then you see how you're doing versus that for most people that just doesn't fit into their lifestyle. And so right. I'd like to design something that helps them, helps nudge them in the right direction. First and foremost, I think everyone, regardless of uh, experience, regardless of age, probably they should give this book out to folks that are graduating high school. It's called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. I, I think I've, I've provided you a copy. It's just phenomenal. And there's a chapter in there that um, really speaks out to me. And it's the, the man in the car paradox. And when I read it, I was like, this is, this is so obvious. But, you know, the, the paradox is, you know, you, someone gets a really nice expensive car and they love cars and maybe they're a car, you know, guy or gal. And, uh, you know, as you're looking at that person in the car, you're really maybe admiring the car, right? So that person's in the car driving, you're admiring the car, but you're not necessarily admiring... You might look to see if it's a celebrity or something like that. But outside of that, you're admiring the car itself, not the person. But the person probably ended up getting that car for right. uh, how they felt they were being viewed, right? So um, the, the, the quote from that chapter is people care. Uh, uh, what they really want is respect, not necessarily stuff. And uh, it really spoke to me in a lot of ways and changed my habits personally. Um, but, you know, that combination of awareness and getting back to rooted decisions and what's really important to you and what really moves the needle there uh, makes makes a lot of sense uh, to me. And, and uh, I think folks find that to be very, very beneficial and helpful. Uh, in terms of being tactful around spending, you know, I like to think about things in time, right? Uh, uh, wealth advisor, money is pretty much what I talk about all day. Um, but time is, an, is, is equally as important. It's mm -hmm. crucial for compounding. You can't really compound wealth without time. But also, if you think about your spending in the context of time instead of in the context of money, how long can I keep spending this way? And that question oftentimes, and maybe I'll illustrate it. So you can keep spending this way for 10 years. And that person, of course, everybody wants to be able to spend the way that they are, their lifestyle forever. But if you can frame things in that perspective, oftentimes people will come to a realization on their own. And then it's a separate you know, kind of series of, of conversations or work to actually uh, figure out how we can help with with spending. That is so good. I love it. I love it. See, it's like reframing. This is exactly what we're talking about. The psychology. It's like you don't tell somebody, don't buy that two hundred fifty thousand dollars surfboard. You tell them, how many of these surfboard can you afford over the next ten years if you keep buying them every month or whatever is the thing that somebody, whatever extravagant thing somebody somebody does. So very good. Thank you for. Uh, um, 
elucidating that. That was that was very well explained. Let me ask Thank you me. another question. There's something that I really want to wanted to touch upon, which is hiring professionals. And I'm not talking about just us, you know, a, a real estate broker and a wealth advisor. I'm talking about people that have a trouble outsourcing. I call it outsourcing, even if it shouldn't be that. When somebody comes to you and say, you know, of somebody obviously that that uh, um, inherited, you know, like a, a a large amount of money, they may be doing before they were doing their own taxes. Maybe you know, I'm using QuickBooks to do my own taxes. They were doing uh, their own investing and all of those things. And how can you? How do you approach the subject of like, okay, we need to put together a team here. <laughs> mm. You are no longer, you know, alone in this process. Yes. You know, it, it, that's a it's a difficult proposition, and frankly, everyone has a different personality, right? Some folks really want to uh, get into the the nitty gritty when it comes to their finances, and everyone at the base level, whether you outsource it to a professional or not, you should be aware of some basic uh, numbers or metrics, right? You should know your net worth, you should know roughly how much you're saving, you should know kind of what you're, you're at, where you are on the on the progress towards whatever that goal is, if it's retirement or something else, for sure. Um, but outside of that, you know. It's very, very difficult to compounding. I'll just start with this. Compounding, as we've talked about, takes a very long time. It starts off very, very slow, and then it grows a little bit, and then it just compounds into this mountain of, of progress. And that's compounding in wealth. It's compounding in um, you know, uh, any, any skill set, really, uh, both positively and negatively. And oftentimes, if, if you are doing something or, frankly, not doing something, it will not be until years and years down the road that you realize that. And I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with folks who go something on the lines of, of this. I wish I had known about this X years ago. I wish I had done this X years ago. And it, oftentimes they're just very, very simple things. And so you can find a professional uh, in multiple different ways. I mean, every industry is, is pretty much the same where you have different fits for different people, right? There's some people, uh, as a financial advisor, might charge a percentage of what they're managing. Some might charge a flat dollar fee. Some might charge hourly. And those things all have their own distinct pros and cons, depending on how you uh, view the world and how you do things. So uh, I think it's a everyone needs a, a blind spot check is, is what I like to say. I like that. And, you know, it made me think of the of the, you know, when they say the best time to start was a long time ago, but mm -hmm. the next best time is today. Yes. Right. And yes. that comes yes. to and things like that. All right. Let's it, you know, if, I, if I could just add to that. Um, Absolutely. The, the last so 2008 through 2009, a uh, very tumultuous time. And then we had this zero interest rate time period up until about 2022, right? And uh, interest rates have gone up almost 5% in about a year and a half, five and a quarter. So it's very possible that that 12-year period of time, and if you came of age in that 12-year period of time, was just a flicker uh, in the, the long history of uh, the financial world. And historically, it was an aberration. It was very, very different than the rest of normal financial markets. And right. so if you grew up, you know, 10, 10, 12 years is a very long period of time. And so if you are used to a certain way of operating because things just work that way for 10 to 12 years, you may not have the historical context to, to uh, withstand the next 12, 20, 30 years. Very, that makes total sense. Let's change gear a little bit. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about your journey. When did you realize that you, you were going to, when you were a little kid, where you're like, I'm going to manage money when I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> no, not not at all. Uh, I've always been uh, fairly technical, um, like to tinker around with things. And really, I wanted to go into, com I was at AP Computer Science in high school. Uh, it's, it's something that I always wanted to do. But, you know, I really uh, realized something about, we talked about where your spending behaviors and where your financial education comes from. It comes from your childhood experiences, uh, family, et cetera. And I realized that I really needed to work on that area, not just for me, but for um, my family, for my family's legacy. And so uh, that really turned me into turning on to, you know, uh, economics, which I have a degree in economics, um, financial services, trading. So 2008, 2009, I was uh, a trader, trade execution for I forget what the AUM was at the time, but I think it was something like $7 million. And I mm -hmm. effectively watched the Dow Jones go from, uh, 14,000 to 7,000, just cut in half you know, in a short period of time. And all of the tactical things that the smart people on Wall Street were doing, uh, the SEC was asleep at, at the wheel in a lot of different ways. Um, the rating agencies 
were rating things as AAA or AA, very high quality, but they ended up going bankrupt or going away. So mm -hmm. it, it was enlightening to me to realize that, you know, you really have to take responsibility of this stuff uh, for yourself. The buck stops with you. And it's one of those things that you can't outsource. We were talking about outsourcing. You can't outsource your education around um, your, your responsibilities as a family steward. So uh, my path was kind of dictated by uh, the banks and the failure of the banks in 2008 and 2009. And of course, this idea of being a fiduciary, doing the right thing for, for your clients. And it's extremely important to me. I don't sell insurance. I don't sell life ins um, annuities. All I do is uh, manage portfolios and give financial planning advice for a fee. And to me, it's very important that when I speak to someone and give them advice that they can trust the advice that I'm giving because, and I say this a lot, uh, incentives explain behavior. And you, if you kind of think of the world this way, a lot of the things that businesses and people do are because of the incentives around uh, how it's done. That makes total sense. Very nice. Thank you for sharing that. Before I let you go, I play a little game at the end of my episodes. And this is, the, I have a list of 30 questions uh, numbered from 1 to 30. And I want you to pick a number. So you're going to be responsible for the question that I want to ask you. Pick a number from 1 to 30. Ooh, uh, let's see here. I will pick 17. 17. Very awkward answer. Oh, okay. I like this one. Why were you given your name? That's a very good question. Why was I given my name? So I was named after uh, Richard Knott, Rick Knott. And my father was uh, Richard. I'm actually Richard Knott III. Uh, okay. So there's a Richard Knott the first, and there's a uh, Richard Knott the second. And even the very thought of that, we were talking about legacy, it, it just really speaks to me. So I, I believe I was given my name uh, you know, after my father. Pretty simple. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, uh, before I let you go, tell me about Rick Knott the first. Who was your grandfather? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, that, that uh, frankly is a, a very, very long story uh, that, that uh, we should share over a beer. But... You know, the, the short answer is I have two kids, uh, two boys mm -hmm. for right now, four and two. And uh, what makes me really so excited about being with them and being a father and being able to enjoy my time with them is uh, I'm able to effectively provide an experience for them that not everyone necessarily uh, has. And so, you know, it, it's probably the best part of, of my day. It definitely is the best part of my day. We have a three-day weekend coming up. It will be the best part of my three-day weekend. Uh, but I'll leave it at that. Well, wonderful. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. If anybody needs to get a hold of you, what is the best way to reach you? Best way to reach me is email uh, rnot, R-N-O-T-T, -T, at lordmurray.com, L-O-U-R-D-M-U-R-R-A-Y.com. Wonderful. Rick, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much for being part of the Probate Realtor Show. And I look forward to the opportunity of having you back in the future because we only scratched the surface. Absolutely, Matthias. I appreciate it. Thank All you very right. much. Have a, great, have a great weekend, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Probate Realtor Show. Find more episodes and interact with us at probaterealtor.la. That's probaterealtor.la. Listen, ask questions, and get results. Don't forget to like and subscribe. The Probate Realtor Matias Baker Mazzucci is a licensed real estate broker in California, DRE number 02054763. Any legal information provided is for informational purposes only and not for the purpose of providing legal advice. Contact an attorney to obtain advice with respect to any particular legal issue or problem. We make no guarantees as to the accuracy of any information. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.